Well, as we get started this morning with our message, I want to ask a question. How many of you went to the movies this weekend? Any uh, quick raise of hands? Who went to the movies? Uh, how many of you saw the new Avengers movie that came out? Okay, quite a few people. I'm going to be really honest with you here. I care nothing about the Avengers, okay? Now, I know for some of you, you do. Don't, don't judge me. I won't judge you. I promise. Um, I'm one of those people that I've got a very specific taste in movies, but I know, I mean, I saw on Facebook, everybody and their mother was going out at like midnight to see the Avengers and staying up till three, four in the morning and writing about how great it was. Uh, don't worry. Again, I haven't seen it. Probably won't. Not going to spoil anything for you, but... That's not really my, t my cup of tea. When I was a, a student ministries pastor back in Long Beach, California as well, like all my students loved like the Marvel superhero kind of movies or especially what they loved was Lord of the Rings. And when I told them I had not seen it and had no plans on seeing it, uh, they looked at me with shock. Like, what is wrong with you? Why would you not do this? Well, I have a very particular taste in movies. And for me, the types of movies that I love to see are ones that honestly tell like an inspiring story or especially ones that talk about life change or redemption. I'm kind of a, a sentimental, if you will, in that way. But one of the favorite movies that I think I have ever seen is uh, the movie Unbroken. Has anybody seen that movie here? It's the story of Louis Zamperini. And uh, for those of you that don't know this story, uh, Louis Zamperini was, uh, grew up as a very troubled youth in the early 1900s. He uh, got in a lot of trouble, but one of the things that he loved to do while he was growing up was running and eventually became a, an Olympic runner. And I believe it was the 1936 Olympics, I believe, that he participated. But soon after the 1936 Olympics, when World War II started, uh, he uh, went into the military and became a bombardier and flew, I believe it was a B-24 bomber uh, and ran a number of raids over the Pacific uh, during his time in service. And if you know his story at all, it goes to tell us that uh, on one of these daring uh, raids, his plane, his bomber crashed in the Pacific Ocean. And the story goes that he spent, what was it, four 47 days adrift in the Pacific Ocean on a raft, and he was one of two people that would survive this. But when they survived and when they were rescued, they were rescued by enemy forces who took them and put them into Japanese POW camps. And so what would happen with Louis's life while he was adrift in the ocean, uh, the story goes is that he called out to God and said, God, if you'll save me, I'll give my life to you. And then he is rescued, and he spent the next two years of his life in captivity in these POW camps. And this was uh, uh, one of those guards by the name of uh, Watanabe, and uh, they called him the bird. Uh, apparently, he was the most uh, brutal and sadistic of the guards, and the way that he would brutally beat these men uh, and U.S. servicemen that were in captivity. For two years, Zamperini experienced this. And then after a couple of years, he was liberated. And when he came out, he, he was very, very popular. Not not just because he had been an Olympian, but being this POW that had been rescued and telling this incredible story of being adrift. But in the midst of all of that fame and everything that came with it upon his return, he tells the story that he was an incredibly broken man. He was a man that was dealing with nightmares on a consistent basis of the brutality that he faced when he was a, was a POW. He talks about the fact how that turned him into an angry man, a very angry man with a lot of hate for people in his heart who experienced anxiety on a continual basis. And because of this, he turned himself to alcohol and nearly lost his family because of the brokenness that he was experiencing. But the story continues to go that his wife suggested when Billy Graham was just starting his crusades in Los Angeles that they go together and she convinced him to go. And he recalls that on that first encounter of going to the crusade, he heard Billy Graham give this incredible message of, of Jesus Christ and salvation, but he wanted nothing to do with it. And he left that night literally angry and his wife was trying to convince him to go back the next night, but he was mad because of the conviction of his own sin and struggle and brokenness that he felt. And his words to her were, I will go back, but the second he tells people to close their eyes and bow their head, we're out of here and we're leaving. Well, that second night, Billy Graham gave this incredible message about our brokenness as human beings. 
And it spoke clearly into his heart. And he spoke of God's love and his grace and for his forgiveness and his restoration for broken people. And that night, Louis Zamperini gave his life to Jesus Christ. And this picture tells the story of, of him meeting with, with Billy Graham. But one of the incredible stories and the redemption that takes place here is not just this man who was incredibly broken, gave his heart to God, but his life was so transformed that he went back to Japan and literally preached the gospel message in a prison camp to those men who had been jailed as the guards to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. And the story goes that many of them gave their hearts and lives to Jesus. I love stories like this of redemption. And in the last many weeks, we've been going through a series together entitled The Passion, talking about the greatest story of redemption that has ever been told, of how Jesus Christ experienced suffering and pain and so many other things in his last week leading up to his death and so doing so that we could be reconciled to God. And as we talked about last week, we talked about the fact that at the end uh, of the message, I said that though we have talked about his death and his resurrection, all that he has accomplished, there is this great story that takes place in the book of John, chapter 21, that I want us to close this series with. And that is the encounter that takes place between Jesus and Peter. The last that we've seen Peter, he has denied Jesus three times before his death. And carrying with him the guilt and the shame that comes with that. He was an incredibly broken person. As we see here in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 22, we see that Peter is broken. But the beautiful part of this redemption story is that God's story in Peter's life was not done yet. And as you will see this morning, no matter how far you have gone from the Lord or how inadequate you may feel before him because of your past, God is not done writing your story either. If you have your sermon notes, I'd encourage you to take them out and follow along with me. And before we jump into the passage, which if you have your Bibles, you can turn there to John chapter 21. Before we do, I want us to take a look at the significance of what takes place in Peter's life by doing a quick recounting of his life. So Roman numeral number one is this, from Simon to Peter to Simon. This is the story of Peter's brokenness, but also the story of our own brokenness. When we encounter Peter the very first time, we see that his name is Simon. Jesus changes his name to Peter, meaning the rock. And then we will see in this passage in chapter 21 in his brokenness, Jesus again refers to him by that original name before he was called by Jesus. And we see the story of Peter's brokenness and really our own laid out before us. Letter A, Peter had a very thrilling thrilling beginning to his relationship with Jesus. He was chosen by him to follow. And as we look at who Peter was before he was chosen, the book of Acts actually identifies Peter as someone who was unschooled and ordinary. There was nothing uniquely special about him. He had no religious training whatsoever, and he was just a common laborer, a fisherman of the day. And for him to be chosen to follow Jesus, a rabbi, that, that he could follow and learn from was one of the best things that this uh, young Jewish boy could hope for. And so the story goes in the book of Matthew that Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee and Peter with his brother Andrew are out fishing and Jesus sees them and he calls out to them and he says, come and follow me. And it was one of the greatest moments in their life. The passage tells us that they left everything to follow Jesus. They left their nets behind and went to follow him. And what would translate Inspire over the next years with Jesus together is this incredible story of how they would learn from their rabbi, from their master, from Jesus. He was an incredible teacher unlike anything they had ever heard before. They were able to see the incredible miracles that he would do in healing people and, and healing the sick and, and transforming people's lives. There was incredible power in Jesus and incredible authority that he carried with him. They were surrounded by crowds and throngs of people that just wanted to get close to Jesus. Jesus. And here's Peter in the midst of this, a thrilling experience as he walks with Jesus. And yet, let her be, we see in his story, as often happens in our own, that the flesh takes over. And there's sin that was, that was harboring itself in Peter's life that began to affect even his own relationship with Jesus. Jesus. 
You see in the Bible that Peter was with the disciples when the arguments were taking place over who would be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven as the disciples were arguing together, seeking for greatness for themselves, not necessarily thinking about the fact that Jesus had been teaching them about being servants and caring for others and putting other people first. We see Peter as well rebuking Jesus when they're at Caesarea Philippi together. And we'll talk about this a little bit more in, in a few moments. But Peter rebukes Jesus and, and shows that his focus was more on what Peter thought would be good for the Messiah than what God wanted to do and accomplish. If we look in the King James Version of uh, the book of Matthew towards the end when, when uh, Jesus and his disciples are in the garden together and Judas comes and betrays them, we see that it says in the King James Version that Peter smote the high priest's servant uh, uh, modern vernacular says that he smoked him. He pulls out his sword and he cuts off his ear, again showing that he doesn't understand the purposes of God and is attempting to follow his own direction. And then we see Peter who is so boldly proclaimed that he would be incredibly loyal to Jesus. We see him deny him three times. And as he does, he is left broken feeling the weight of his shame and his guilt as he has denied and betrayed his own master. And the truth is, is that as Peter is left broken, it's a very true thing for all of us. Let her see that sin always leaves us broken. Sin's allure is that it promises us that if we go our own way and do our own thing outside of God's plan, that we will find even greater joy and we will find even greater satisfaction or fulfillment in life. It's been like that from the beginning. Adam and Eve had the same wrestling as they were in the garden and Satan tempted them to go against God's design and God's plan for them. The belief in their heart was that they would find something greater than what God had provided for them. And so they decided to go on their own and sin's allure is just that. But sin satisfaction is also often only momentary. And every time it leaves us empty, needing more in order to be filled, or it often also leaves us broken by its consequences. It leaves us broken in this way, but it also leaves us broken in our relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, if you're not a believer, that goes without saying. If you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ, there is no relationship. That relationship with your creator is completely broken. But for believers, oftentimes our sin leaves us broken in relationship with him. It leaves us with an empty feeling, a feeling of unworthiness, or maybe even a numbness that causes us to not realize just the depth of our brokenness, but maybe a sense of distance from God. I can tell you in my own life, a few years uh, uh, when I was in college, I think it's a few years ago. Oh, that's funny. That was a while ago. When I was in college in my own life, there was a period of time where I was really struggling with sin in my life. And I, I tell you something, as a Christian, I often doubted whether or not I was actually saved. I had this belief in my mind that I could never be good enough for God. And I didn't feel God's presence, even when I would go to church or try to spend time with him. I often felt like I was nothing but a fake or a fraud. And the truth is, is that there are a number of Christians in God's church today whose this is their experience. They live this way. And it's often far greater than we are willing to admit that we live under the shame of our sin and as broken people. But we've been taught by the church to hide our sin. We've been taught to put on the good Christian face so that everybody thinks everything is okay. We don't let people see our brokenness because we think to ourselves, if I let them see how broken I am, they won't accept me. They won't like me. They'll reject me. They'll label me as a failure. I'll never be trusted. I'll never be used by God. I will always be this broken person, especially if I let other people know. And so what do we do? We hide. We hide. We hide our brokenness and pretend as though it doesn't exist. We shove it down and we try to put on this picture that everything is all together, though we are broken inside. And we quietly often and silently deal with that brokenness, which causes us to doubt our salvation, that causes us to believe that God looks at us as though we are not worthy of him. And we can't feel his presence and we feel like we're fakes and frauds. We hide. 
But what we learn today from this passage, and as we look at Peter's life, is that in our greatest brokenness, Jesus, letter D, isn't done with me yet. And as we look at Peter in this passage, in chapter 21, verse 15 of the book of John, we find this truth to be true. That Peter in his greatest moment of brokenness is about to realize that Jesus is not done with him yet. Roman numeral number two, Jesus brings us face to face with our sin. And what I want you to see is this is exactly what takes place with Peter in this passage. There is something beautiful that happens when we are honest about our sin and we embrace our brokenness before Christ. And you will see that in this passage. If you have your Bibles, read with me in John chapter 21 and let's look together at verses 15 through 17. It says this, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? More than these? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. And then he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter said to him again, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. And then Jesus said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And it says that Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And so Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. As we look at this passage, I want us to understand the background. The beginning of chapter 21, verses 1 through 14, tells us that Peter and other disciples have traveled from Jerusalem after Jesus' resurrection back up to their home base up in the sea, around the Sea of Galilee. The passage tells us that that night, Peter and some of the disciples have gone out again to do what they had always done, to get on a boat and to go fishing. And the passage tells us as they went out to go fishing that they didn't catch anything. Sounds like a common problem for these disciples. And so it says that Jesus comes along and tells them to put their net on the other side. And it says that they pull in a large haul of fish and then they realize who it is. And Peter jumps out of the boat and he runs and, and they all come in together. And Jesus has prepared a fire on the beach in front of them. And as they sit there together and have breakfast together, this conversation between Peter and Jesus takes place on that beachhead. And Jesus says, letter A, do you love me, Peter, more than these? And I want you to think about the significance of the words that Jesus speaks there. Do you love me more than these? Most scholars and commentators believe that Jesus was referring to one of three things, potentially. Number one, they believe that what Jesus meant when he said, do you love me more than these, was do you love me, Peter, more than your old way of life? Peter has just come back. He is back in the Galilee area. He's gone out on the boat. He's fishing like he always used to do with fishing gear all around. He had gone back to what he knew and was living that life. And some people believe that that Jesus is looking at him and saying, Peter, do you love me more than this? You love me more than your old way of life, what you've come back to? Other commentators and scholars will say, number two, that Jesus meant, Peter, do you love me more than you love your friends? When we read in chapter 21 at the beginning, it says that Peter went out fishing with Thomas, with Nathaniel, with the sons of Zebedee, and with two other unnamed disciples of Jesus. And so because they're there sitting around with them as they talk, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me more than, than you love your friends that are sitting here with us? But yet a third idea that scholars believe is number three, that what Jesus meant was, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than your fellow disciples love me, Peter? 
And what we know about Peter is that he had a high opinion of his loyalty to Jesus. He thought himself that he was a model of love and loyalty. We see in Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 16, that Peter himself would say to Jesus, or when Jesus said to his disciples at Caesarea Philippi, who do you say that I am? Peter responds with this bold, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. In other words, you are the Messiah. I believe it, I know who you are, and I am following you. And then in the next verses, when Jesus speaks of his impending death to Peter, Peter blurts out and cries out, this shall not happen. I'll never let it happen. I'm loyal to you. I am with you to the end. No one will do this. In Matthew chapter 26, as the disciples are gathered together in the upper room, Peter even says, as Jesus again is talking about his coming death, he says, even if all will fall away on account of you, Jesus, I never will. I'm loyal till the end. Even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And yet, as Peter sits here on the beach with Jesus, we see that Peter had hardly lived up to that image that he had had for himself of the one that loved Jesus the most and was the most loyal to him. And let her be in asking Peter three times, do you love me? Jesus opens up the wound that Peter has been living with for a very long time. The wound that Peter was living with was the denial and the betrayal that he, that he was struggling with, the feelings of unworthiness and of guilt and of shame. But I often wonder, even as Peter sat there, not only did he deal with the guilt and shame from what he had done, but I've often wondered, did he remember back to the words of Jesus that Jesus spoke to his disciples in Matthew 10, 33, where he said to them, whoever denies me before men, I will deny him before my father. I've often wondered if Peter was wrestling with that himself and saying, I'm not worthy. I can't be one of his. There's no possible way because I have failed. And what we see Jesus do is he asks this question three times is that he opens up the wound and the pain and the very thing that Peter wanted to hide and that he wanted to run from so that the healing process could truly begin in his life. When I was a student ministries pastor in California, again, I took a group of students down to Mexico on a mission trip. And uh, while I was there, I bought a really big Swiss Army knife. I was take, took a stick that I found in the woods and I was trying to whittle it into an exact replica of this here finger. Why? I have no idea, but it looked cool. So I started working on it, you know, kind of whittling it off and creating the cuticle and all the lines in my finger. And towards the end, I was trying to really put the dent in to make the cuticle look real. And with this nice, brand new, large Swiss Army knife, it slipped off. Off the wood, and if you look, I have this massive, massive scar here. I cut my finger half off. Literally, my finger, I, I, I cut it, I held it up, and it fell open. And I thought, I know, <laughs> yeah, try being the one that did it. Uh, and the pain that I experienced from that was intense. My, I was so afraid of it, I wanted to just take it, I lifted it up and I held it together. And until I got to the Red Cross an hour later in Ensenada, I held that puppy together and I was fearful of what would happen. But I remember getting into the Red Cross and the very first thing that the doctors did is that they took it and they reopened it all the way like it had fallen open. And they took and they began scrubbing on the inside of it to clean it. They took a really large needle and shoved it right into the meat in the middle of my, I know, right? In order to numb the pain, but to do that. And then they stitched it up. They did all of this to begin the healing process. They opened up that wound to get to the place where it was broken, to get to the place where infection could set in, to clean it, and to allow the healing to happen from the inside out. Jesus opens up the wound and the pain and the very thing that Peter wanted to hide and run from in order to allow the healing to begin to take place within his heart. In confronting Peter's sin and opening up his wound, Jesus brought Peter face to face with his sin. And in the process, he took away the foothold that Satan could have in Peter's life of telling Peter that he should doubt his own salvation, that he was inadequate to follow God, that he was a failure, and that he should experience nothing but shame and guilt because of what he has done. As Jesus opens that wound and allows him to confront his sin, he literally takes Satan's grip on Peter's life and says, it's not yours, his life is mine. 
He takes Peter and opens the wound and teaches Peter that it's okay to be a broken person before God because God wants to restore and to redeem our lives. And he did it with all of the disciples around who could hear the conversation and in the process allowed his grace to overflow on Peter in a way that he may not have experienced his love up until that point. And in the process, he shows Peter as well that his brokenness will not keep him from being used by God as he calls him to continue his kingdom work. Let her see why does Jesus bring us face to face with our sin and our brokenness? Number one, be, and I'm gonna walk through one through five really quick. They're gonna put them up here and then they'll put them all up at once. Be, the reason Jesus brings us face to face with our sin and brokenness is number one, because understanding our brokenness. Number two, and facing our inadequacy. Number three, opens up our eyes. Number four, to the extravagance of God's grace, number five, and our need for him. I want you to hear that. Why does Jesus bring us face to face with our sin? Because understanding our brokenness and facing our inadequacy opens up our eyes to the extravagance of God's grace and our need for him. And this is exactly what Jesus does with Peter and what he does with us. As Peter faces his sin, and that third time that he asked that question, I think it's so intriguing that is, the question is asked that it says that Peter was grieved. He's now dealing with the fact that he's feeling all of the guilt and all of the shame of not showing love to Jesus by actually sticking up for him. And he opens up that wound, and in the process, Peter begins to not only understand the depth of his brokenness and his need for God, but also he comes face to face with his inadequacy. And one of the beautiful truths that we learn is that when we do this with God and we admit our failure and our need for him, it is a beginning of a healing process that takes place in our life. When we stop lying to ourselves that it's okay and we shove it down and we try to hide from it, the beginning of healing happens when we confess it. I've often said it's far easier for a non-believer to come to Jesus Christ than for a believer who refuses to see or admit their own personal sin and brokenness. The reason is this, is because we have become good in the church at making excuses for sin and covering it over and living as though it never happened, even though we continue to live broken on the inside where nobody ever sees it. As Peter begins to come face to face with his brokenness, facing his inadequacy, the lies that Satan is telling him that he can't be good enough, and he realizes that God does not look at him with shame and disappointment, but is freeing him from his bondage, Peter's eyes, as our eyes are, are opened up to extravagance of God's grace and of his love and of our desperate need for him. And Jesus' response, Roman numeral number three, to our brokenness opens up the door for radical transformation in our lives in the same way that it did for Peter. When we open up ourselves to confess our brokenness to God and to each other and to deal with who we are as fallen people, it tells us that we can experience in the same way that Peter did the depth letter A of the fact that you are loved by God. That in your sin and in your brokenness, God loved you so much that he sent his son to go to a cross because he wanted you back that much. There's nothing you need to be ashamed of or hide from or hold back from God. But God wants you to confess that brokenness so he can begin that healing process as you experience his love and let her be understand that his grace is sufficient to cover over your sin and your brokenness and all of your shame and guilt. When Jesus died on the cross, it satisfied the wrath of God against sin. For those who place their faith in Jesus, his grace is sufficient. And let her see you are forgiven by God. But it doesn't end there. Because if it ends there, it can leave us in that place of thinking, well, God's looked at me and said, okay, it's good. That's, that's enough. But I think the most powerful part of this passage is the understanding of letter D. That Jesus looks at us and says, I'm also restoring you. You know, when I, uh, 20 years ago is when I had the opportunity to go to Israel. And uh, you'll see this picture up here. 
was a beachhead in, at the Sea of Galilee. And this picture was a picture that was taken uh, an evening where I was really struggling. You know, for me, going to Israel was one of the most exhilarating times of my life. I was able to spend time there seeing things that I'd always read about, uh, experiencing the places where Jesus himself walked. It should have been the most thrilling and exhilarating time in my life. But the truth is, is that I was wrestling with a lot of sin in my own life and dealing with the guilt and the shame and the voices that Satan was putting in my head telling me that God didn't love me, that I wasn't good enough, that I needed to perform better in order to be good enough for him. And I can remember that even as I was seeing all of these places, there was this heavy, heavy weight sitting in my heart telling me that even though I saw all these things, I wasn't good enough. And I sat one night just outside my bungalow on this beach looking out at the water, overwhelmed by the fact that I was sitting in the very place where this conversation happened between Jesus and Peter on that beach over a fire and breakfast. And I opened up my Bible to read in the book of John chapter 21, this account of Jesus and Peter together. And as I read it, I wept. I wept not just because I heard and experienced and saw how God loved Peter and how he forgave him and showed his grace to him. But the part that was most significant and transforming to me is how Jesus in that moment and in that conversation restored Peter. As Peter responds, yes, Lord, I love you. Jesus's constant response was then feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Peter, I am restoring you. You are vital. You are important to me. You play a significant role in the kingdom work and I am going to use you still. And for me, as I sat there and I experienced that and I read that together, I had this flood of emotion as I recognized that God was saying to me, Rob, though you are broken, though you have experienced and given yourself over to sin and you feel all of this shame and this guilt, Rob, I am not done with you yet. And in this story, Jesus looks at us as broken people and says to us, I'm not done with you. Don't let Satan tell you that that shame and that guilt and everything that you've done keeps you from being used by me. For the reason I sent my son is so that you would be restored and I am not finished with you. And that's Peter's testimony. Peter's story as he sits at this fire is that it was a transformational moment in his life where he goes out from that moment and he goes out and we see that God uses him to take the gospel message of Jesus Christ and his love for this world to spread it around the world, being used within his kingdom. And what I find so interesting is as this story wraps up, we see this conversation kind of take a left turn and Jesus begins to talk with Peter about how he would eventually die. And Peter, probably a little bit bothered by that, looks and sees another disciple and says, well, wait, Jesus, well, what about him? How's, how's this all gonna work out for him? Is he not gonna die? What's gonna happen to him? And listen to Jesus' response to Peter. Jesus says to him very clearly, if it is my will that this disciple remains Until I come again, what is that to you, Peter? And listen to his instruction, very simple. You follow me. Peter, stop getting caught up in all of these things that do not matter. I have called you again and still to follow after me. And this call that Jesus gives to Peter is a call that he gives to all of us who place our faith in him. Letter E, come follow me. It is a call to yield our lives to God and it is a call to tell others about God and his love and his grace. And it begins when Jesus calls for us to follow him with coming and yielding our hearts and our lives to him, recognizing his love and his grace and recognizing that even in our brokenness, he desires for us to come. 
but also it's a call for us to go and to preach the good news, to share with others of the redemption that they can experience in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ desires to bind up and to heal their brokenness. But also that call to tell others of Jesus and the work that he has done is also a call for us as the church to be careful not to bind up people in their failure and in their sin, which we have been become good at at times. What God has called us to be as conduits of his redemption in this world because of what he has done in our lives. I want us to take a moment to pray together. And I want to ask you to close your eyes with me and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. But I want to ask you this question before we pray and as you are, your eyes are closed and we begin to focus our hearts here on the Lord. I want to ask you this question. Has the Lord been speaking to you this morning? Has there been sin in your own life that you have been holding back from God? maybe even that you have not been willing to face, that you have been stuffing down, wanting to pretend that it's not there, and yet in your brokenness, eating away at your heart. Have you been wrestling with the guilt and the shame that Satan wants you to believe that you are not good enough for God? Or maybe you're here this morning and there's someone that God has been putting on your heart that he wants you to share the message and love of his redemption with and of how he has changed and transformed your life and how he can do the same in theirs. Maybe even what has come to your mind is that there is someone that you have bound up with an unforgiving heart because of their own sin. And you know this morning that God wants you to go and to release them and to be part of his work of being the conduit of his redemption in their lives. Wherever you're at this morning, whatever God has been speaking into your heart, the call to follow is a call first to acknowledge that you hear God. And then the choice is yours to respond. So as we are faced with our brokenness, as Jesus brings it before us, we can continue to shove it back down and pretend it doesn't exist. Or we can acknowledge, God, I hear you. And God, I want to respond and the choice is ours. So before we pray and as your eyes are closed, I want to ask you to take that first step this morning of acknowledging that God has spoken to you, that you have heard his voice, that maybe you've been wrestling with sin, Maybe you've been wrestling with guilt and shame and trying to suppress it and hold it back and Satan keeps telling you you're not good enough, that you could never be acceptable for God. Maybe you have found yourself shaming other people because of their sin and binding them up and you know that God wants you to release them. Maybe you know people that need to hear the message of how God has redeemed your life because they desperately need that in ours and you know this morning that Jesus is calling you to respond and to go and share. Before we pray, I want you to take this morning that first step of acknowledging that God has spoken to you. And I wanna ask you to do that in this moment by simply doing this. If you have heard God's voice in one of these ways this morning, just simply raise your hand to acknowledge, Jesus, I have heard you this morning. Don't be ashamed, raise it high. God, I have heard you this morning. And you are calling me to respond to your call. Praise God. Praise God. Father, I want to pray and I want to ask that, Lord, your Holy Spirit would move in in our hearts and our lives. That, Father, where we have struggled under the bondage of sin and shame and guilt that Satan uses to hold us down, I pray, Father, that as we come to grips with our brokenness, but even more as we come to grips with the immensity and extravagance of your love and grace, that we would be broken free from that bondage, God. That we would not be afraid, Lord, to, to admit to others and to admit to you that we are broken and need you, Lord. And as we do and we respond, God, I pray that you would break Satan's grip on our lives and that you would begin a radical transformation in us through your son, Jesus Christ. And God, I pray for each individual here that you have been calling to go and to share with another person of the redemption story that you've made in their life and that God, you want for someone else's. I pray that you would give them the courage to respond and to go and to be a part of the kingdom work that you want to accomplish in and through their lives.
Lord, help us to be those who do not simply hear your word, but who meditate upon it. And that when we have heard from your Holy Spirit, that we respond to the glory of your son. In Jesus' name, amen.